There are moments in life where you decide to get external help. And this help, for example, can be consultancy. And once more, consultancy is in the crosshair of criticism. Thank you very much for the countless emails that reached out to me in the last couple of days. Of course, I had to do research on the matter before and check all the facts and not be based on just one piece that most people send me and they refer to. And the question is, how does modern consultancy look like? And we're going to go through an actual scandal, which is a part of McKinsey's history now, or now part of the discussion about McKinsey. One aspect I want to be very upfront with, do not generalize. This podcast will not talk down on McKinsey because that's pointless. I work with people from many different consultancy backgrounds. Many of them delivered excellent results, were absolutely brilliant and spot on. However, there are obvious issues. And we today need to talk about how does contemporary modern, a, a, a contemporary modern approach to consulting look like? But of course, the question is, why do why, why is the consultancy industry actually grow, growing? So first, pretty much anyone has too much work on the table. You probably remember when you work for a longer time. I am one of them, one of these people as well. And when you worked 20, 25 years ago, you had way more people on board. So more and more tasks get put on your table and you should work the same time frame or probably less because people tell you do not build up any kind of over hours. At the same time, the demands are increasing, getting higher and higher. At the same time, you have less time to complete these tasks because you can choose between either doing over hours, which of course no employer wants you to do, but when they give you more tasks in the same time frame, in the same amount of time, you of course have higher demands immediately. And that, in many industries, at the same time when regulatory and compliance raises with the demands exponentially, and not only the demands by one of learning of laws or rules, but also the regulatory and compliance aspect, which has a scope which reaches for the whole, which is for the whole business. And many stakeholders need to be dealt with when it comes to this regulatory and compliance demand. And all of that at the same time when you need to do daily business as well. And while all of that is the reality right now, on top of all this, the tolerances for mistakes or errors or wrongdoing get less and less and less. While 20 years ago, sometimes people said, oh, yep, something went wrong. We're sorry and moving on. Today, the consequences are often severe, they're getting harder by the minute, and the liability you have personally also gets closer and closer to you by the minute I'm talking here. And that's the reason why many people say we have uh, different experiences with what we did internally, and we need certain probably expertise or help, and then you get consultants in, because they are there temporarily, at least that's what you hope. However, as we all know, there are pros and cons to consultancy. And the reason why this episode happened was people reached out to me, uh, John Oliver's Last Week Tonight, which is considered one of the most influential political satire, political comedy shows worldwide. It is so influential that even now you already find scientific evidence for the John Oliver effect, which means John Oliver addresses something on his show and afterwards serious senior executives or politicians pick up the matter and act on the matter, even when no one has done anything for 20 years before. So John Oliver's last week tonight had an episode about McKinsey, and no doubt it was a major takedown. I put a post on LinkedIn because, in my opinion, not on everything he mentioned, he was right. You can read the details on my LinkedIn post, which I just recently posted. Today, we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of consultancy. And of course, how can you find out if you made the right pick? So there are obvious advantages in the first place. First, um, you, you get an external view. And an external view can be tremendously helpful because you know that the longer you work in a certain environment, sometimes you just don't see obvious advantages. Also, with good consultants, you often get the scientific point of view. Consultants often have scientific means, which means proven tools that actually work. There's scientific evidence to that. And you know, it's an opinion, someone is coming with a tool that actually works. Also, an additional aspect can be that experience, decades of experience from many people from the industry can be transferred into your organization because when you are sticking to the trial and error method, when you do trial and error just because you did something wrong, does not mean that you now do how to do it right. And when you say, oh, we just keep on doing trial and error, well, when you have clients with your organization, there's a certain moment where people say, look, things can go wrong once, uh, maybe twice, 
But when we talk about trial and error the third, fourth, fifth time, just clients will walk. They will go somewhere else because just because you've done something wrong doesn't mean that you know how to do it right. And that's where good consultants or excellent consultants can help very well. And also, um, very good consultants are able to empower you. And empower you means that they are able that you can do it by yourself at the end of the consultancy gig. They are not there and walk away and nothing works. They make your organization, they make your people, they make your departments, they make everything with your, within your organization able to perform the task you need by yourself. That is the true value of consultancy. Besides, of course, legal aspects, you do not have to employ them. You have no pension contributions. You don't have to give them an ongoing contract. When the contract ends, they simply can go away. You don't have to stick to any kind of employment laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that there's a number of advantages. However, and I know that people don't like when I criticize my own industry. I work in training, speaking, coaching, and mentoring consultancy is part of professional delivery. It is part of when you, when you do project or interim management consultancy, most likely is, is part of the gig. And I know people don't like when I criticize my industry. However, we can only grow when we call out what's going wrong. And uh, by the way, the last weeks were... Quite a special experience from some colleagues who wrote me reasonably nasty emails about my criticism in the industry. We have to stick to reality. Clients appreciate that because when you criticize your industry, you are able to grow and do it better in the future. So let's look at the disadvantages. So first, bad consultants do not empower. Bad consultants deliver because they can do something you can't. As soon as they walk, the task is gone, the expertise is gone, the experience is gone, nothing works again. That's bad consultancy. So when, when whenever you have these people there, you had someone who delivered a service, but their goal was that you book them over and over and over again, which is not the task of a consultant. If you want to have that, so for example, when you say you're a small business, you want to have an external IP, uh, I, IT person, Perfectly reasonable, but then you do not get a consultant, you get an external IT service provider for a completely different amount of money, by the way, which is way lower than how someone who delivers temporary consultancy to you. Next aspect, often you have a catastrophic choice of consultants in organizations. So very often when I see things going south and I, and I ask them, so where did you get this consultancy company from? Or where did you get these consultants from? I often hear, well, these are people who I, and then you hear the usual phrases. I went to uni with them. I knew them from the football club. Basically, it's mates booking other mates, men booking other men. And then you have these insiders network. It's basically a clique. And this clique suddenly wants to do something with a limited amount of expertise, but because they like them, they gave them the gig. That is catastrophic. You always need to focus on experience and expertise. I know that many consultancy companies work with the system that I mentioned before as the bad example. And you have countless, uh, countless different approaches. And by the way, when, when John Oliver talks about McKinsey, McKinsey is not the only issue here. McKinsey paid, as far as I know from an article in the Financial Times, more than $900 million in the opioid scandal in the US, while Bain & Company, as a major consultancy company, is banned for 10 years from public tenders for being part of the South African consultancy and bribery, sorry, a bribery scandal. Um, KPMG had countless lawsuits against them with the, with the bankruptcy of Carillion and out-of-court settlements where they didn't even disclose the amount of money. Uh, before PricewaterhouseCoopers now in Australia had a partner banned for eight years because they did tax consultancy and then already leaked the results to other clients and told them what's coming up there, which is, of course, a breach of contract and also a conflict of interest. And by the way, exactly that was also mentioned by John Oliver, where during this opioid crisis, McKinsey worked with the same consultants to consult on the FDA, which is allowed to bring drugs on the market and opioids while working for opioid companies, which is obviously a conflict of interest that you have to disclose. And of course, maybe the client says, I don't care, but most likely the client says, I do care. And please bring someone else in there, or we probably just choose a different consultancy company. But I know that often in companies, the principle is as soon as McKinsey consultants decide to leave consultancy and work with one of their former clients, Former McKinsey employees get in other McKinsey consultants, same as Boston Consulting, Accenture, Bain & Company, et cetera, et cetera. That is not a quality approach. When this is the way you hire consultants, you can blame yourself for any kind of catastrophe that follows afterwards. 
There's, of course, another aspect, which is called pseudo-consulting, or the polite term, the euphemism, political mandate. It means consultants show up, and then the board says, well, we think we should do X, Y, Z. Just do research. Maybe you want to have something else. We think X, Y, Z is perfect, but maybe you want to do A, B, C, or D, E, F. We think X, Y, Z is brilliant, but uh, just be open-minded and tell us what you think. And at the end, you get a couple of hundred pages long uh, written consultancy expertise letter or report. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, they come to the conclusion that A, B, C or D, E, F is not the solution. But X, Y, Z, as the board suggested, is exactly the right thing to do. That is pseudo consulting. It gets even worse when you have particular interests represented by consultancy companies, because when you look into evidence, which is now piling up step by step, you often see con certain consultancy companies saying that we need to cut costs in the lower level of the hierarchical pyramid, while um, team leader or higher, especially executive pay, has to go up, which is, of course, a very popular opinion. And by the way, that is deeply rooted in McKinsey, one of their former consultants, Arch Patton wrote the book on executive pay, which is called, and I quote, this is the actual title, Min, Money, and Motivation. I'm not making this up. He didn't say people, money, and motivation, or humans. No, no, he said Min, Money, and Motivation. That's the title published in 1961, published again and again. I don't know the, the, how many it is. You, you still find it online and can buy it off the shelf, so it is still around very often, because otherwise they would have discontinued it already for decades, and they didn't. Arch Patton with his pay more for executive approach, where he by himself admitted that he feels guilty about the publication today. This Arch Patton at a certain point in time was nearly accountable for nearly 10% of McKinsey's complete billable hours and value creation. Let's just think of your organization and one person would be accountable for 10% of all the money you make. And you will often say, this is not possible. Well, in this case, it was. And of course, this is not a sustainable approach when you say cut costs by the numbers somewhere the lower levels and pay more for the upper levels for whatever reason. However, the main factor of critique, the main aspect of critique is when you have consultants who do not have one important aspect. And I give you one guideline. And that's the most important one. Experience and expertise deliver excellence. Experience and expertise create excellence. Deliver excellence as you like it. And often I see that these big names in consultancy use people who come straight out of university. They get pushed into a certain company. They speak to people who are in the industry for 25 years. And they say, hello, I am here with zero minutes experience in your industry. However, I am going to tell you how to do it better. And I'm not talking about getting external point of view, having different generations of the organization. That's all fine. However, when you tell people, and I do not mean that you tell them, might you do that? You tell them, this is the way you have to do it. When this is the consultancy you deliver, a problematic to say the least. I have absolutely no need, and that's an issue that I always make absolutely clear when I work in project and they have consultants. I'm willing to pay a lot more money for people with experience in the industry. If you bring me people straight from university with not a single day of experience in the real world, I will not accept them as a consultant. Full stop. And I know that some people build careers, and I know how problematic these people often are in organizations for a reason. I work with New Horizon and Microsoft and uh, the partnerships nationally, internationally, around the globe. You can see all that on LinkedIn. I worked in factories, uh, different kind of jobs before I dared to advise anyone on anything. And I think it was a good choice that I did that. When you get people in who have no experience, but they should tell you people how to do it better. That is walking the line of insanity. Of course, you now might think, well, when we have this aspect of experience and expertise deliver excellence, how can I spot bad consultancy? What are the main factors, of course? I mean, I just called, I, I just taught you some. However, there are main aspects which you can spot. So number one, as soon as you see these buddy networks, these insider deals, these cliques, instead of having a quality selection, alarm bell number one rings. Number two, when you have a so-called political mandate where executives or leaders tell the consultants what they expect as a result, alarm bell number two, and the alarm bell number three is record payment beyond any reasonable means or industry standards. Always justify it with they are so great they can they can charge that. 
And because no, they can't. There are reasonable limits for most kinds of payment. So when you see one of one out of three or all three aspects, buddy networks, cliques, insider deals instead of quality selection. Number two, the results get dictated in the very beginning. There's no real consultancy taking place. And number three, record payment beyond all means or industry standards. These are the main alarm signs. And when you then get people with no experience, good luck, because that is a waste of money. However, taken together, very good consultancy can be very helpful because you can always, when you do not have these big names who are, of course, politically connected, and they will probably be there forever for one reason or the other. M many reasons of them are non-diverse networks. However, when you have excellent consultants who are often working with understatements, they are not known to the general world. However, they work excellent on the subject matter with their experience and expertise these people are brilliant because when you're a bad consultant you get booked once and then you get a bad reputation and you won't be booked again which means you're so bad that you leave the market in one way or the other and then stick to a different job which by the way is perfectly fine when you do something wrong anyone has the right to have a second chance no exception that's how democracy works excellent consultancy can help a lot so when you pick the right people the right way and stick to the main guideline, experience and expertise delivers excellence, then you will have a lot of great experiences and gainful insights to expertise with your consultants in your organization. And for that, I wish you all the best. And of course, there might now be a number of questions. And of course, um, if you'd like to chat with me, just drop me an email, nb at nb-networks.com. I also put the email address in the show notes of this podcast. Also, I put the LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile in there. Feel free to chat there with me as well. You also find me on Instagram and Facebook. And feel free to chat me up there as well if you'd like to. And if you have something very specific where you say, hey, we need someone for a training session or for, for a speaking gig or for, for coaching, consultancy, project, interim management, whatever it is, um, just drop me a line and we take it from there and see if it's a fit. But of course, we can also just talk about your questions and talk them through. It doesn't cost you a penny. Second aspect, which I always recommend is we have live sessions. And when you want to access them, go to expert.nb-networks.com. I also put that link in the show notes of this podcast. And when you register with your email address there, you receive only one email every Wednesday, which is 100% confident that a content that's an ad-free guarantee. And uh, this one email includes when the next expert session happens. It's, of course, bilingual. You can use it in English or in German. Feel free to join. And then we have a chat there. The third aspect is the most important one, which I always recommend at the very end of each and every episode. Apply, apply, apply what you heard in this podcast, because only when you apply what you heard, you will see the positive change that you want to see in your organization. I wish you all the best doing so. For help, I'm available 24-7. Just drop me an email or contact me on any other platform, and then we take it from there. So at the end, at the end of the podcast, there's only one thing left for me to say. Thank you very much for your time.